Good evening, everyone. My name's Dick Cole. I work for the Heritage Trust as their sites officer, and it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce Andy Jones for this virtual story cafe about the Trust's community excavation at Trativi Coit in 2019. Andy's a graduate of Sheffield University way, way back in 1991, <laughs> and he's had a distinguished record as an archaeologist with the Cornwall Archaeological Unit ever since. He's a a real specialist in terms of prehistoric Cornwall. No, I and think he's, he's just, turned it off. And he's just published a new monograph of five excavations of later prehistoric sites in Cornwall. And it's such a good book, it'll cost you 50 quid to buy it. There you go. <laughs> um, I've worked with Andy for many years. He really does know his stuff. And um, as Belinda said, if everyone in the Zoom meeting could actually keep themselves on mute and cameras off, and we're also being broadcast live on Facebook and this is being recorded. So I'll stop there, other than to say there'll be an opportunity for questions and comment after Andy's talk. So I know you're all gonna very much enjoy this. So over to you, Andy, and thank you. Thanks very much, Dick. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about excavations, um, which we undertook, Cornwall Archaeological Union undertook, um, in 2019, which seems a long time ago in a very different world somehow from what it is um, today. Um, we carried out the excavations for the Cornwall Heritage Trust in 2019. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to divide it into five sections. So a little bit, first of all, to say what we knew about Trithivi Coit uh, before 2019, what information we had about it. And then I'm going to give you a kind of potted history of Cornish megaliths, chamber tombs and coits. And I'm going to start in the Bronze Age and then work back into the Neolithic when uh, Trithivi was constructed. And I'm going to say a bit about portal dolmens because Trithivi coit is an absolutely fantastic example of a portal dolmen. And I'll talk about the investigations that we carried out and then think a little bit about how those um, results have come together so I expect everybody here will know exactly where Trithivi is, but uh, by way of introduction, it's in southeast Cornwall. It's on the southern fringes of uh, Bodmin Moor. It stands on a low hill with stream valleys either side, which probably provided good access routes uh, up onto the moors above. Today, it stands within in, in a green field, which is being mon uh, managed by Cornwall Trust. It's been long known about actually, and it's one of the sites which has had one of the longest kind of uh, historical interest in it, if you like. Uh, it was recorded in the uh, 16th century by John Norden, who referred to it as a little house raised of mighty stones standing on a little hill within a field. So it has this very early reference to it. And it's also locally known as, as the giant's house as well. And as well as being described very early on, it's also been repeatedly drawn because it's a very much an iconic monument. This top drawing here is actually Northern 16th century uh, drawing on it. It's one of the earliest ones we have of a chambered tomb. Uh, and it's you, can, it's, you can see on here two very interesting features. One is this here, which is the hold in the top of the capstone, which uh, some people haven't uh, have wondered when it was made, well it's certainly there in the 16th century, and the other one is this like little doorway in the front stone, and that's also there in the 16th century, so again it's not a later cutting out as has been suggested sometimes. Aside from uh, Northern's drawings, it was a favoured site for the for 19th century picturesque tradition, you can see this illustration down the bottom here from the earlier 19th century, uh, of its type it shows the uh, Hill, the um, site almost standing on a hill, so it's been so greatly extended the proportions of the site. And look at the size of the very small sheep down here, gives you an idea of the exaggeration. And then in the late, late 19th century, when archaeology was first sort of under, uh, getting going with antiquarians such as uh, Gourlays, the first and sort of more accurate drawings and illustrations are made of it. And this is uh, uh, William Borlase's 1872 illustration from Nainai Kenobii. So 
what do we know about it before the excavations in 2019? Well, actually, if I'm honest, uh, not that much. We knew that it's a portal dolmen, that it's one of the most spectacular uh, portal dolmens of its type uh, that survive. It's um, probably, therefore probably dates to around about 3,800 to 3,600 BC, but that's entirely by analogy with other sites of this type because there's never been a recorded excavation inside its chamber. We also know that it's made of overlapping granite slabs and that these are not local. The, the site does not stand on the, on the granite itself. It's off the granite by some way. Uh, and we'll come on to that again later. It's surmounted by this capstone. I've already drawn attention to that hole, which you can see here in the top corner. Uh, we're not sure whether that hole was there in the Neolithic, there was certainly a depression in, set into the stone, but whether it was, went all the way through in the Neolithic, we don't know, uh, but it's, it's, it's likely to have been picked as a capstone because of the fact that it had a distinctive marker on it. And the other very distinctive thing about it is this door stone in front of this sort of entrance that we can see here. Uh, no other Cornish chamber tomb has such a feature uh, set within it. Uh, Although there are other examples of chamber tombs elsewhere, especially on the continent, which have means of access where people were taken in, uh, in, in, in burials into the chamber. Now, so moving on to uh, Cornish uh, megaliths, it's quite a confusing subject, partly because archaeologists and antiquarians over the years have described the same monuments in many different ways. So there's lots of different terminology uh, that's induced interchangeably. So coit, cromlech, megalith, chamber tomb, portal dolmen, all used in completely inconsistent ways by archaeologists and by antiquarians before them. And that often confuses people as to what we're actually talking about sometimes. Um, the other source of confusion with them is that uh, can be, uh, with the Cornish ones, is that not all of them are wonderfully preserved. The top two rows on this illustration here are illustrations of sites which are Trithides at the top there. This top row are portal dolmens, the three Cornish portal dolmens. Then we have others which are very much simpler like Tuncoit and uh, Molfro that you can see on this middle row. But when you drop down below that, the majority of the sites are actually rather amorphous. They've been reset. Nobody's quite sure where the original stones went in many cases. Uh, and this may, means they're quite hard to classify. And then you end up with a site like Bosphorus that we looked at in, I think, around 2014, I think it was, uh, uh, with the Archaeology Society, which it really was unclear whether it was a chamber tomb, a giant kist, and indeed whether it was Bronze Age or Neolithic. So I'm trying to give now a, a, a posse kind of backwards, starting with the most recent, going back to try and give, provide some kind of order to what uh, for the wider context of Trasebi. So the most recent chambered tombs that we have in Cornwall are the entrance graves. And these are Bronze Age. Uh, on the Cornish mainland, they were all found in Penwith. There are around about 15 examples of them. And unlike the other chamber tombs we'll be looking at, they are all, nearly all uh, sited close to good areas of farmland. So this green area in Penwith are areas which are good for agriculture and the blue dots, which are the entrance graves, are nearly all located near to those green areas. Uh, they are very much related to other forms of Bronze Age monuments, which are found around the Atlantic facade area. So there are similar sites in Ireland, Wedge Tombs and Tremor Scilly Group. There are lots on the Isles of Scilly, there's about 80 there. And then there are similar monuments on the western coast of Scotland at the Grenon. Uh, and one or two on the Isle of Man as well. So these are very much associated with uh, seaborne connections in, in the Bronze Age. And they're simple sites. This is one is at uh, Tregiffian. Basically, they're either circular or donut shaped, and they have a simple chamber, rectangular chamber, covered by flat laid slabs. And then uh, uh, some of them have curbs of stone. This one, Tregiffian, is actually the, um, the best. Uh, example or most elaborate example uh, on, in, in Cornwall, any, on the Cornish mainland anyway, and it's also associated, associated with rock art and it's the only one of its type uh, on, in Penwith to be associated with rock art. This is a facsimile 
uh, that was put back into the um, site after its excavation. Now, recently, we've been able to get uh, radiocarbon dates from two of these sites, Tregithian, and these dates are hot off the press, so to speak, we just have them back. Uh, we now know that this site dates the period 1800 to 1600 BC. We've uh, uh, dated 10 of the cremations inside the, inside the site. We've also dated uh, Basiliac a few years ago uh, near Ding Dong Mine. That's come out around 1700 to 1500. BC. And all the sites we have of this type, they're all associated with cremation burials. So we push back a little further in time. We have strange megalithic uh, uh, constructions, sometimes referred to as prop stones, uh, which are almost impossible to classify. This is the three brothers of Kugwith on the, on the lizard. Uh, like Tregithian, it is associated with cut marks on its top uh, stone here, we, there are a series of cut marks upon it, and we'll find out across all the classes of tomb, they're quite frequently associated with rock art. Another one here, uh, Le Skernic on, on Bodmin Moor, this big slab propped up, again very very hard to date because it's standing on top of granite, but uh, I suppose about a decade or so ago, now a colleague of mine, Peter Herring at the time, uh, <clears throat> went down and viewed this site uh, from a nearby long barrow on the slope below it and noticed that the mid sun, I think it's the midsummer sun sets in the space between the stones here, uh, uh, it would have set between them in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Neolithic period. So he suggested that, that alignment was deliberate and this was a Neolithic monument. Again, there are potentially cut marks on here, there's a series of depressions on top of it. We're not entirely sure if these are natural or whether they were humanly made, uh, but either way it's likely that those distinctive cut stone made it selected for use on the monument. And then more recently uh, we've excavated a site at Hendraburnik, another big prop stone site uh, associated with rock art, which you can see on this bottom here. This is a huge epidiorite block of greenstone, just the sort of stone they were making to axes in the Neolithic. And here, because this is in um, uh, an area where there was uh, preservation of soils beneath it, we were able to do radiocarbon dating. And here we find it's dating to 2600, 2300 BC or thereabouts. So it's very much late Neolithic. So we're pushing back into the Neolithic and we then come to our main chamber tomb construction horizon. Uh, and this is a map of Cornwall showing all the uh, chamber tombs and long barrows, which are of uh, Neolithic, earlier Neolithic dates, I should say. And immediately you'll see there's two colors. So the orange triangles, these are your long barrow type sites and your green ones are your uh, chamber tomb type sites. This one here is Trithevi. You can see it's very much an eastern outlier of those chambered tombs. And the majority of the long barrows are found in the eastern half of the county. And the majority of chambered tombs are very much concentrated in the western half of the county. And in fact, again, as with the entrance graves, most of them are located in Penwith. Uh, and, uh, but unlike the entrance graves, most of them are located upon hilltops uh, like Trasevi, so they're, they're in elevated positions. So as I said, Trasevi is very much of an eastern outlier of, the, of this group. This is a major concentration. You get similar concentrations in the, in, in, in the west of Wales, for example, uh, and, but they don't tend to go that far east. In fact, there's only something like two or three possible examples in Devon. Oops. So here's a couple of examples of those Penwith uh, chamber tombs, this one, Chun Coit here, which is a very simple structure, closed chamber with this whacking great capstone on top of it. Recently, we've identified rock art on top of it, simple cut marks are on the surface of the stone. This one is classifiable, but then next to it, we have uh, Lanyon Coit, another iconic site. Uh, but we don't know its original form because unfortunately it collapsed and they just put the stones up anyhow to get the 
uh, get the capstone back on top again and, and secure. What we can say though is it seems to be standing on the end of a platform and we'll come on to that again later on in the talk. And then in another pen with tombs, unclassifiable, but this one's important. This is at Speris, uh, Speris Coit. Uh, uh, it's a small site, capstone's missing off it, uh, but it's one of the very few where the chamber has been excavated. This is Charles Thomas and Bernard Wales in the 1960s, I think it was. Uh, and they found cremated bone inside it, which was recently radiocarbon dated to around 3,600 to 3,500 BC. So it's early in the Neolithic. But they also found inside it uh, later objects as well of Bronze Age date, uh, including a saddle cairn and, 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 uh, and, and a flint knife. So that's the problem also with these sites are is that the chambers can be used for very long periods of time. And actually, this pattern continues outside of, um, of Penwith into in mid Cornwall. So we have uh, uh, Lesquite here, uh, unclassifiable tomb largely collapsed um, so its original form is unknown. Carwinan has recently been uh, reset up and there was some excavations in the chamber area here. Uh, they did find sherds, I think 20 odd sherds of Neolithic, uh, pot, early Neolithic pottery inside here but then they also found late Neolithic pottery too and the bone which was some burnt bone from the site uh, was radiocarbon dated and that came out as 3,100 to 2,900. So that's very much in the late Neolithic. So centuries after the monument had been built, people were still putting things inside the chamber area. So that gives a kind of background to the kind of uh, the sequence of chamber tomb constructions. Now within those uh, early Neolithic tombs, there is a group of three in Cornwall, which is down here, which I'm going to talk about now. So here are the three sites here. This is Trefebi again, at that kind of eastern end of it. You'll see there's none in, uh, um, in, in, in England or, or Scotland. But moving up the west coast of Wales, we can see there are several sites here. And then up around Harlech and Flynn Peninsula, there's another cluster here. And then there is a major concentration uh, in Ireland. So this is all about movement around this Irish sea zone, the western tip of, of Cornwall, up Wales and into Ireland in particular. So this is showing some very definite connections. And many of these sites in this group uh, have, are associated with rock art again. Uh, and this one is a very fine example, probably the finest example of, 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 of rock art on the uh, portal dolmen. Uh, and this is Bachwen, uh, again, up in northwest Wales. So what is a portal dolmen? I've mentioned the term several times now. So just to give you uh, a description of what it actually, I'm actually talking about, this is Penshry Fan in, uh, in Pembrokeshire on the end of the Priscillas. And the reason it's been classified as a, as a uh, portal dolmen is that it has this very definite frontage on it, which is common to all of them. That is two very large projecting jam stones, this one here, there and then set back slightly uh, in the doorway is a door stone. Now sometimes these are very low, we'll see a couple of examples of that later on, but others as the pencher I found they run all the way up so they're almost sort of flush with the top of the capstone and that's the other uh, distincting, distinctive thing about these tombs is they have a capstone that's set at those kind of jaunty angles that's sloping back down away from the entrance uh, and at this site uh, and at some others, uh, the, the door frame is emphasized even more by uh, large stones flanking the, 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 the chamber area. So this frontage area here, so you've very much got uh, the impression of the importance of, a, of the uh, doorway. Now, the best um, dated example that we have of one of these sites and one of the best preserved is actually the other side of the Irish Sea in that concentration. This is in County Clare in the uh, far west of, of Ireland, Polnabrone. And this site's exceptional because it's located on limestone and that means that burials are preserved in it. The uh, sites we've seen so far, human bone doesn't survive unless it's burnt. 
uh, because the soils are so acidic. Here at um, Colnebrone, it's on the uh, limestone pavement, and that means all the burials inside it, or majority of them, were preserved. And they had something like 35 people buried inside here, a minimum of 35 people uh, buried inside here. Uh, and from those, they were able to get 20 radiocarbon determinations and dated the site to 3,800 to 3,200 uh, BC. And that means for a period of about 500 years or so, people were adding uh, family members or community members into the chamber, probably very gradually over a very, very extended period of time. And we have to think about this in terms of, of, of Trithibi, the kind of length of use of the chamber. As we move across the Irish Sea back into the, the, the British side, uh, the situation changes. This is Carrig Coten in, the, in, in Pembrokeshire. Uh, see the frontage of it here, the port of the Portal Dolmen. Uh, and excavations inside here, I think in the 1980s, 90s, uh, did find early Neolithic pottery, but there were no human bones surviving because of that acidity of the soil uh, in, in the west of Wales. Uh, so all they had was uh, cremated bone and they were able to get some dates from here which indicate activity in the earlier Neolithic but also then going on again very much later. So that's the kind of potted history of, of what a portal dolmen is. We we'll now move back into Cornwall and I said there are three of those. The one that we know least about, I'll start with first, which is Porton Coit which is on the St Priot Downs. Uh, this one has never been excavated uh, and all we have from here is a survey record. So we can deal with this more fairly briefly. Again, it's got the very distinctive capstone on top of it, which you'll, which you'll see, but it's situated, this chamber seems to be situated within uh, or close to the end of what is a low cairn or perhaps a platform. Um, we know rather more about the other really well-preserved uh, Cornish portal dolmen site, which is Zenacoit. So you can see here that the, the door stone here, the projecting side stones. This one has a more elaborate entrance, these two very, very large flanking stones uh, either side of the entrance. This is the only example of a Cornish portal dolmen where there has been any excavation of the chamber. Uh, and this again was uh, Charles Thomas and Bernard Wales back in the 50s. This actually is very close to Sperris Court, as I showed earlier. And I think they must have spent a couple of weekends roaming over the over that bit of moorlands of doing excavation. But well, they excavated inside the chamber here. Again, they've got a, a cremation, but this time the data to about 3,300 to 3,000 BC, which is late Neolithic. And they also found late Neolithic groovedware as well wet stones, which are obviously associated with, with, with metalworking, and sherds of early Bronze Age pottery. So unfortunately for this one, we don't know the original date of its construction. All we can see here is when people, probably centuries later, have added in stuff into the chamber again. So this takes us to um, Trasivi uh, in 2019. So uh, the, um, the, the field at this time was uh, come under the management of Cornwall Hedges Trust and we uh, discussed a project which was agreed with, with Historic England and it was agreed that we'd undertake a GIF survey of the whole field, which knew nothing about the context of the whole field before this time, uh, which hopefully would identify features which would relate to the, uh, to, to the, to the chamber tomb. And then we would carry out some test pits, uh, not in the sheltered area. We weren't allowed to touch the chamber, uh, um, which was um, not least it's scheduled, but not least because it's also be quite a kind of quite a dangerous thing to actually. I don't know if you saw in the earlier photograph that the backstone has actually uh, been pushed in at, at some point. Uh, so it's scheduled and so we set up a buffer zone around there of, of two meters. And then beyond those, we excavated uh, 26 one meter square test pits. Uh, and so what we're looking for with those is was to confirm what the geophysical survey had shown uh, uh, and then uh, establish how well preserved the archaeology in the field was around the, the monument and hopefully get artifacts 
and evidence of what was going on around the coit, which would help us to better understand its wider context. So we actually did two geophysical surveys. The first one was uh, magnetometry. And actually normally magnetometry works very, very well in Cornwall. It's one of the best techniques. It, it did work here, but it was less clear than some others, some other sites we looked at. So this area up here is the, is the chamber tomb. You can see the black uh, areas here. This is, these are signs of uh, where something's been dug into the ground where there's been some disturbance. You can see a group of pits in the middle of the field. This dark line here is relates to a removed hedge boundary. And this white scar alongside it is, is where there is evidence for the remains of the, the bottom of the hedge bank. And down at the bottom end, we picked up further blobs looking like they could be pits. And we often find uh, pits, I should say, in the uh, dating to the early Neolithic and later Neolithic period in Cornwall, which are often filled with objects. So we're obviously hoping that we might pick up some evidence for activities taking the field around the coit. We got very excited about this feature. We had about half a day of, of, of excitement about this. So this looked like a very major feature cutting across the field here. Uh, the black segments, the interrupted nature suggested that it could in fact be Neolithic, uh, an inter Neolithic interrupted ditch system is, 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 is the unknown, uh, until somebody went out and looked on the side of the field and saw there was a standpipe. And what we're actually looking here is a water pipe. And this, wouldn't be the first time that uh, water pipes, have, you know, quite small water pipes have, have created very large anomalies which have excited archaeologists. We uh, also undertook a, a resistivity survey and resistivity usually works actually less well, but this is the reverse in this case because uh, you can see there's some kind of feature down here that the, it was picked up. Uh, this here again is that that's that, removed hedge boundary. Uh, Residivity, I should say, works in reverse to magnetometry. So the dark features on this case are stony features. Uh, but we got very excited at this end of the field, and we'll come back to this later. This is the coit and wipe the stones are, uh, sorry, where, where the monument is where they couldn't survey. And we have this very regular dark area around it. So we got very, very excited about what that could be. So, uh, we started off with our test pitting. The red squares here are our test pits, and I'll deal with it from west to east. So, uh, moving from the bottom of the field up towards the, the monument. So, at the eastern end of the sorry, the western end of the field, we dug six uh, test pits. Uh, this is an area where there were pits and potentially some ditches. Uh, but all we found actually in terms of features down this end was uh, was a, were a couple of plough marks from where the uh, where the field had been ploughed. So there's just furrows down there. And we had a single prehistoric flint, which Phil here is was very delighted to find because the other finds we'd had from the bottom were all of uh, post-medieval date, bits of china and clinker from, uh, from engines uh, and, and that kind of thing. This is our single prehistoric find from down the bottom. We also excavated a group of about 14 test pits here in the central part where there were the further pit type anomalies uh, and that removed hedge boundary going through here. Uh, again, we didn't find any evidence for prehistoric features in this area. We did find a single pit, which was this one. Uh, and this is kind of stone lined around the top. So we got quite interested in what this might be when we first uncovered it. However, when we started digging it, we realized that the fill inside it, the material we put inside it was actually very loose uh, and very dark. Uh, and those kind of give the hallmarks of it being not that ancient. Uh, um, so we think what we've got here is some kind of pit probably associated with the removed hedge boundary uh, and likely to be post-medieval in date, probably hundred years or so, some, something of that order. But we did have a few prehistoric finds in this area, most uh, some couple of bits of flint, and the most notable one uh, being this hammer stone, this cobble hammer stone that we can see here, which is certainly uh, uh, prehistoric. 
The only thing I'll mention about actually is the both the central and east and western parts of the field that we've seen so far is that there are no greenstone fragments down that end of the field from the, from the centre onwards. And you'll see why I mentioned greenstone later, but I'd just like to point out. So we were looking at the natural geology in each of the test bits and recording that. And this lower half of the field and central part, there was no greenstone in it. So moving on to the area that we were uh, hoping that we'd find uh, evidence associated with the coit, this very dark splodge here, because we knew this would mean that there was stone in it. And we started excavating, and I'd say the, we didn't find very much in the way of artifacts. Uh, at one point, we got quite excited about um, this one. This is a slate, and we could see even with uh, when it was muddy, there was a series of lines incised upon it. I don't know if you can see these here across there. And we have from other sites in Cornwall, uh, notably down in, uh, on the, in the Gadrivi North Cliffs area, we had a series of mesolithic incised slates. So we were hoping we got something uh, similar again, uh, but when it was cleaned, the slate was obviously in very pristine condition. And also, uh, we found that there is a compass rose, which you might just be able to make out. We had this kind of uh, this image created using RTI. You can see a compass rose here. And what we think here is actually this is a, probably a writing slate or something or, or fragment from. So again, probably quite modern, historical. But however, we did strike gold in this area because the six test pits which we excavated here all had this stony layer inside it of packed stones, green stones, uh, and they became more concentrated as one moved to the, to the east and closer to the coit, and more fragmentary as you moved away from that anomaly and petering out, uh, probably as a result of, of, of later plough damage perhaps, but certainly uh, less dense than around the area of, of, of the coit. And to give you an idea of what that looked like, so here is one of the test bits excavated down to the surface, top of the surface, and we immediately recognised there was structure to it because all the pieces uh, were of uh, regular size in the top of it, you can see here, none were more than about 10 centimetres long, they were very sharp uh, and um, uh, and, 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 weren't, and weren't worn. Uh, and we had, luckily we had a geologist on our team who was looking at this uh, and he was uh, convinced that they were quarried, it's quarried stone basically. Uh, and um, they don't look very green here and that's because they've become very patinated. So on this side of the slide, you can get a better idea what they look like when they are broken open and washed. So the patina is gone from, so they would have looked strikingly green uh, when freshly made. So this would have really stood out in the field, as I said before, very much localised to the area of the of, of Trithidi Coit. We excavated through it to get an idea of its depth. Uh, so we, did, we cut a sondage in one of these test bits and we can see the structuring was evident even more so here. You can see uh, these very smaller ones on top, which is on the last one, and they get progressively bigger as they go down. So those small ones are bedded on top of um, on top of much larger blocks. And we've estimated that using the geophysics uh, and, uh, and, and the information that we've got from our, our test pitting, that we're looking at something probably in the region of about 25 metres long, potentially about 10 metres wide. And this goes down in thickness half a, about half a metre. So a friend of mine who's much better at maths than me has calculated that we're looking at about 180 tonnes of quarried stone, probably from a fairly local source, this, this type of greenstone, metagabro um, outcrops, probably within 50 metres or so of the site. Uh, but nonetheless, shifting that tonnage of stone was a major undertaking for any of you do. You're talking at this point in time, by the way, of no metal tools, so it would have been by hand using other stones or antler picks. And to give an idea how it might have looked, this is another portal dolmen site in Wales. Uh, this is Diffinardwy, which is on near to Harlech, where you've got in fact two 
called the dolmens uh, and they are set on a bed of stones a platform of stones which you can see here not green this time but white white water rolled stones so that here also they are selecting a bed of particular type of stones to offset their monuments so I became interested in wondering whether there are any other parallels in Cornwall uh, for uh, cobbled surfaces and platforms associated uh, with uh, chamber tombs. Uh, I mentioned Porton earlier, but unfortunately that's not excavated, so we don't know very much about it. But when the, in the recent excavations at uh, Carwin and uh, Coit, they found there was a platform here. You can see them, these, these stones forming the platform. But this one seems to be very, very much more localised. The, the actual monument stood in this area, so it doesn't seem to have gone very much beyond it. So it's not on the same scale as uh, Trothevi. And the other uh, really good candidate for a platform is this one, Lanny and Coit, we saw earlier. Uh, this was surveyed a while ago by John Barnett. And this is standing on the end of a low mound or platform. Which into which uh, kists have been uh, excavated. These are likely to be in a Bronze Age date. So I think we can be fairly happy that the uh, platform around the coit um, is, 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 is going to be of Neolithic date. It's also very much of a similar scale to Trasidi as well, about 20 metres uh, uh, long by about 10 wide. So based on the evidence we got, uh, we know there's a platform. We also uh, were fortunate to have uh, geologists involved with our project as well. And whilst we were out there, they were looking at the, uh, the geology of, of Trithevi Coit too. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the granite is not local to the site. It's had to be brought here. And it's come at least one and a half kilometres away. Um, Callum and his team's work when they were going out looking on Bodmin Moor, uh, they think it's probably all come from one source on Bodmin Moor because these pieces are very, have a very similar texture to it. And the nearest they could come to in terms of the texture of the granite uh, was um, on Carradon Hill. So that's the north east of the, of the site and it's, kind of, it's come a Kilometre and a half way, as I said, and they'd have had to drag this, each stone weighing several tons, across the stream valley in order to get it onto the hill where the, uh, the chamber tomb now stands. So that was a major uh, undertaking. The other interesting thing about it is that um, I'd noticed early on, and I'd wondered if it was a de deliberate um, um, pecking of the stones that on the door stone, uh, you can see this kind of stippling effect. Uh, and um, so we, the geologists, uh, you know, Callum had a had a look at this, and uh, it's not um, deliberate stippling. Uh, what it in fact is, these are scars left by quartz spalling out of the stones, uh, and um, because the quartz is much harder than the matrix of the granite around it, so they're weather out over time. But this is fascinating because it means this is another kind of augmentation of the entrance way. So the, the portal would have been white on either side of the doorway. Uh, and then of course you've got that holding stone also emphasizing the frontage of the monument. And then there's the capstone, which uh, has got that oh, this very distinctive uh, hole in it, which is the sun shining through it there. Uh, this um, weighs in the region of about 10.8 tons. So it's a, uh, moving it was certainly a major undertaking. Not only that, we know that they didn't just take any stone, they took one from the top of the tour. And we can tell that from this photo, it shows it off nicely, in that the weathering on here is consistent with what you find on the top of a, of a rocky outcrop. So they've gone to the top of the tour and then they brought all the stones back, but they haven't just randomly kind of thrown them up together. They've selected uh, stones and then put them in a particular order, ones with the white, at the front and then the capstone which is also the top of the tool on top as well so there's deliberate method in this 
Um, one thing we haven't done yet, but uh, which I'm hoping we'll get a chance to do in the future, uh, is to look more close at this uh, capstone. There are, looks like undulations. I don't know if you can make some of this out. And I do wonder whether some of these circular depressions uh, will in fact turn out to be uh, cut marks and so there's rock art. So it may be this was a significant stone in the landscape before um, before it was ever used on the, on, on, the, on the chamber tomb. And if it is, that'd be very interesting. It would fit in with a wider pattern of uh, the use of decorated stones in megalithic monuments. But that's one for, the, uh, for a future uh, examination. So just briefly to uh, wrap up, I, I think it's worth pointing out uh, just how significant the, the monument was. It's, you have to cast your mind back and think, this was the only constructed architecture in the landscape. And prior to this being here, Mesolithic people had never tried to make anything like this. So this would have stood out. And there is real determination to create a distinct effect. The green platform, the stones dragged, dragged over a mile, and put up together in a very specific order to form the chamber. So there's uh, deliberate uh, deliberation the methodology in, in all aspects of it and, a and a, presumably a linking wanting to make a linking with particular places in the landscape so Carradon Hill had to be the place where the stones where the stones the chamber came from uh, and, and the colours had to be right as well to achieve their design so there's a kind of localism at one level but I think on the other thing the other interesting aspect about it is although this isn't built to any kind of blueprint there's also a desire to make connections with the wider Atlantic sea zone as well. So this is very much showing localism on one hand, but also connections with the wider Neolithic world with the Irish sea as well, if you, if you, if you like. And actually I should say my, my daughter painted this as a, as a Christmas present for me uh, last, last year. So I'll um, just finish with that. And I'd just like to say, um, Thank you to all the people who helped with the project, thank you the project uh, funders, the Historic England, Cornwall Hedges Trust, uh, and the Cornwall Archaeological Society have all um, provided funding for the project. And also particularly like to thank the volunteers who came and worked out in July 2019 from the Archaeological Society and the Cornwall Hedges Trust, and also the uh, time seekers for undertaking those geoph uh, geophysical surveys in the field. So if you have any questions, I'll be uh, very happy to answer them. How, how would you like to take questions? Um, you, you're, you're the first one in, sir, go for it. Okay. <laughs> Please say your names, I've not spotted you yet. So. Oh, no. Okay. I put the video on as well. My name's Richard Tregoning. I'm a, my family, a mining family, true cousin Jacks, left Cornwall about 1870. And by complete chance, this talk came up after I'd been for a weekend near Hay on Wye, and mm. it's an almost identical portal do dolmen called Arthur's Stone. Ah, um, uh, yes. Arthur's Stone looks so like the Thievy Coit, I, I nearly fell off backwards when we had lunch there, having walked about 10 miles in the wet. However, the question I have is, do you think these so similar all over Ireland and other places are the remnants of a huge number which have been ploughed up and used as building stone in, in more? Because again, Arthur's stone is stuck on a beautiful site on mm -hmm. top of the hill. Um, do, do, do you think they were all set up all I over? and then now have vanished away because people say oh, that's a good bit of stone I'll heat it up and I'll use it in my manor house. Well I think undoubtedly there have been destruction of sites of the uh, we know that from uh, antiquarian descriptions of sites which are no longer around um, but we also know that in other parts of the of, of Britain there are different building traditions I mentioned long barrows and um, so in, in, in which are contemporary so there are different communities and, and various Neolithic archaeologists have, have, have posited different models of connections with oh, Europe yeah. based on different chamber tombs uh, styles. So uh, I think the Cornish and the um, Welsh examples of sort of had up today are very much part of that kind of Western uh, movement and connect connectivity 
uh, around the Atlantic facade area. So I think although there are some megalithic monuments elsewhere in Britain, they were probably, there were other forms of monuments in those areas, particularly timber yeah. uh, in, in some areas, and but also earth and chalk. And of course, they've all suffered as well through later agriculture. But there are, there are real regional distinctive distinctions between um, changing types as well. So, certainly, the, certainly the hay on why. Arthur's stone is almost so identical as buying something out of Ikea, isn't it? It's almost identical doorways, capstone, every detail is the same. That, that's right, although with that one, that was part of a longer structure. In fact, they're digging there now. So I don't, I don't know if you were there when they were excavating this summer, but the uh, University of Manchester are, are doing a project there. And they've, what they've found with that one is it seems to be much, much longer than what we see it today. The other thing I'd, I'd point out, the other difference between that one and this is, is with the portal dolmen, uh, is that um, the uh, Arthur's tomb obviously is very much, it's got the massive capstone, but it's not actually vertically very high. It's quite low by comparison, whereas Correct. these portal yeah. dolmen types, of which are a relatively small number of the overall total, they're very much creating very large door frames, you know, as tall as a person at least, if not in taller in some cases, in the case of Trevithy. Yeah, the, 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 they, said, they said quite clearly, as English heritage, that they haven't yet got any evidence that it goes lower because they, they still haven't done any excavation. There's no publicity about any of the excavations yet. Oh, uh, it was, it was they only, I think they only started this summer. They started, I think, in August doing some um, test, test bidding that I saw online. Uh, but they found traces of a mound going beyond it into the next field, I believe. Now watch this site. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, obviously, people have got the opportunity to put questions into the chat box on on this um, program. We've got the first one, and that's yep. from John Webb, who says, "Is there any evidence to explain why the building of monuments stopped?" Ah, uh, well, it, it does. That's a very good question, actually. Um, it seems to have been a kind of initial pulse in building, probably associated with the start of the Neolithic. It's almost like they're, they're sort of announcing their kind of, I don't know, um, connections with each other. And then you're right, there is a gap in monument construction uh, for about 300 years, uh, although they look like they keep using sites. And then when the next phase of monument construction begins in the later Neolithic, the monuments are very different. So you're getting things like stone circles, henges, and things like that. Now, why that should be, I think is a very good question, but one we don't know the answer for. But you're right, there is a distinct break between the early Neolithic and this kind of band of initial introduction of farming and pottery and whatnot. Uh, and, then the, uh, and then there's a kind of break. And then in the later Neolithic, new forms of monuments co come along. Uh, John, would you be interested in coming in if you've got anything to add? Uh, no, sorry, just, but is there any evidence why the stone circle construction stopped as well? The well, stone circles carried on for an awful long time, actually, much longer. Uh, we've got dates from stone circles now. So the earliest ones are coming in in the kind of late Neolithic and they're round, usually often, often, often round sites like Newgrange, for example, the stone circle. One. Uh, but actually, they carry on through all the way through well into the Bronze Age, and some of the um, uh, dates in Scotland uh, for sort of dates there, I think Croft Morag, uh, are coming out late Bronze Age. So there, they they were doing that for hundreds of years. People putting up stone circles, which is what makes them very difficult to date without actually doing excavation because of where they fit in in that long, very long time period is very difficult. But again, you know, why the Iron Age does seem to mark a, a change in, again, where you're moving into big enclosures instead. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Andy, we've got another one come in from Craig and Maria. Is there the possibility that there are lost monuments in the China clay area? I can think of five um, <laughs> by K work name and that have disappeared down pits. Um, well, certainly there were some colleagues of mine, Pete Herring and um, John Smith, or was, was, was Dick, well, no, did, did a survey back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and there was certainly um, 
record documented features which are no longer no longer survive uh, lots of barrows and all, all kinds of things so but i don't think many chamber tombs actually for, for memory um much more in the way of round barrows and stunning stones actually um, but it certainly went in the in the in the uh, early years of the, of the clay industry craig do you wish to come in or maria yeah. Um, yeah, we'd love to. Uh, I was just thinking back to when I worked for the clay works. Um, I mean, Hens Barrow is still there, but I don't know if it's actually been excavated. No, I was, think, I was thinking along the lines of like Blue Barrow, Cox Barrow, White Barrow, and just driving around, I used to see stones that you think actually was that part of something else. But uh, I mean, you know, the China clay workings actually goes back quite a few hundred years and having worked for them in more recent times when it was a case of, oh, just chuck that to one side, boy, nobody will notice this. How much has been lost? Mm. I mean, it's really, really difficult to quantify. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, I actually have to say that in the last... Well, since I've been working down here, we've you know we've done a number of projects with with, with the China clay industry recording things. Uh, so we've certainly um, worked them uh, in advance of pit expansions and things like that. But yeah, I think before before then, in particular, I mean, if you if you go back to um, Borlase Senior, the, the Reverend Borlase mm. in the 18th century, you know, he talks about you know lines of barrows in, in, the, in the clay in the clay country, which. Um, you know, haven't survived at all. Um, so yeah, I think you know we have lost a, a lot. And you're right, Hen Hensbarrow is still there, but it's it is uh, it, hasn't been, it hasn't been excavated. Uh, and uh, you know, Little John's Barrow is another one which we looked at, I think, in the in the nineties, uh, mm. which I think that was preserved actually next to a road that goes into one of the works. But yeah, you know, yeah, a lot, a lot has will will have gone over over the years. Yeah, I thought, I'd imagine the downs there would have had a lot of barrows in. There. Mm. Yeah, as far as I know, um, I mean, I didn't, I, I've moved from Roach for many, many years now, but back in the early 90s, Hensboro, the, um, the pinnacle of it, if I can put it that way, was still preserved. Mm. Um, and I don't think, and like you said, I don't think anybody's ever ex excavated it. it. It's scheduled so they can work around it, but they can't work into it. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so it's still in place. Yeah, so it's it's still yeah. there, but I don't know how visible it is anymore. I've been up there for a while, up there, so um, but it's it's still there. no, neither have I. Um, so they used to have a trig point on top. Yeah, this is why I yeah. say it used to have a trig point on top, but um, and that was yeah, like I say, that was back in the nineties. So mm -hmm. I don't know now. No, I think that's probably the last time I would have. It was probably in the late nineties, I think actually. But yeah, it was yeah, there. it must have been probably about ninety four, ninety five. Yeah. The last time I was just up there. just a day or two ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank I you, don't, yeah, so I don't know what well, it looks like now, but yeah. Whatever Dick says, the 90s don't see that long don't go to me either. Actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, shockingly, yes. Uh, Brilliant, thank you. Um, Andy, we've got our first question on from via Facebook, which is any thoughts on men and toll being originally a quit of some sort? That's been suggested. I mean, men and toll. I, but I actually, at the moment, I I think that I'm Preston Jones's um, survey work that I think it's got. I think it works best for me. It may, it may be in part of the chamber. There's no there's no reason why it couldn't be some kind of pool. But yeah, and certainly, certainly would work. Uh, but that part of Penworth, there are a number of whole stones in, in a variety of, of sites. Obviously, you've got um, um, I'm in the site now. Um, um, we've got a, a line of whole stones and then round men, uh, round Trigifian, there's a series of whole stones there as well, very much smaller than the Menent hole. Uh, so there are, there's a kind of making holes in stones tradition uh, down, down in Penwith and in, in West Cornwall. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, um, a colleague of mine, Anne Preston Jones, did a survey of the area around that after Gorsa and identified the stumps of what she thinks might be a stone circle. So I think my best guess at the moment, although, although it may have been lifted out of a chamber tomb at some point, it seems to have been the centerpiece for, for, for a stone circle. And I think that works, works quite well, but who knows? Okay. 
Thank you, Andy. We, we seem to be short of questions for a second, so I'll just ask a very boring one. Um, obviously, with the excavation having been completed, where are we in terms of the publication? Ah, I, I'd hope you, I'd hope somebody does that. Right, so yes, it's uh, it's with Cornish Archaeology. I'm hoping it will be in the next volume. And when's that likely to be published? So, um, so well, it's, I'm not the, the editor of that, but I, th <laughs> I think I, th I think I think I think the I think it, the spring 2022. Brilliant. Last, last I heard. And that's something that's uh, obviously all members of the Cornwall Archaeological Unit automatically get copies of as part of the journal. So that's yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it will be it will be in there. Yeah. Okay. I will just listen again. If anyone else has got wants to put a question into the chat box, or okay, seem to have gone quite quiet. So I th think that's a compliment, Andy, that it was such a wide talk actually put in the actual excavation the monument into a very broad wider context and uh, I think that's been really appreciated by everybody so I'm sure everyone will agree with me to say thank you for a really really entertaining evening and uh, I sincerely hope that everyone enjoyed what's been put on today by the Cornwall Heritage Trust and hopefully you'll look to support other of our ventures in the future so thank you to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Andy. It's been a really good talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming along as well. Thank you.